I'm just going to read from Book 2, Chapter 7 of De Melza. And this is the preparation for the, the assembly room's ball. When in the end, without consulting anyone further, Ross decided to go to the celebrations after all, and when, after an uneventful ride in, Demelza found herself shown up into one of the bedrooms of the great house, the townhouse of the Warleggans, there were several worms of discomfort within her to spoil the first flush of excitement. First there was compassion for Ginny, who last night had tried to hang herself from a beam in her own kitchen. Second, there was anxiety about Ross, who had not be yet been entirely sober since his return and carried his drink like a gunpowder keg, which any chance spark might set off. Third, there was unease over Julia, who had been left in care of Mrs. Tabb at Trenwyd. But all these reservations, vital though they were, could not quite destroy the pleasure of the adventure. Some inherent good taste told her that this house had nothing to equal the Elizabethan charm of Trenwith, but she was overwhelmed by its bright furnishings, its soft carpets, its glittering chandeliers, its many servants. She was overwhelmed by the large number of guests and the easy familiarity with which they greeted each other, their expensive clothes, their powdered hair, and patched faces and their gold snuff boxes with glittering rings. They were all here. George Warleggan had seen to that. It was like a preliminary, pre preliminary regal reception before the public entertainment of the ball. Or all were here who would come. The Lord Lieutenant and his family had politely declined. So had the Bassets, the Boscowans and the St Albans not yet ready to put themselves on a level with these wealthy upstarts. But their absence was unremarked except by the perceptive or the malicious. Melza had a confused recollection of meeting Sir John this and the Honourable someone else, and had passed in a dazed fashion in the wake of a servant up the stairs to her bedroom. Now she was waiting for the arrival of a maid who was coming to help her put on her new gown and to dress her hair. She was in a panic about it and her hands were cold, but this was the price of adventure. She knew herself far better able to cope than with John Treneglos, who traced his ancestry back to a Norman count than to face the prying eyes of a saucy servant of a saucy servant girl who, if she didn't know what Demelza had been, would soon be ready to guess. Demelza sat down at the dressing table and saw her flushed face in the mirror. Well, she was really here. Ross had not come up yet. Dwight Ennis was here, young and handsome. Old Mr. Nicholas Warleggan, George's father, big and pompous and hard. There was a clergyman called Hulse, thin and dried up but vigorous looking and moving among the aristocracy like one of them not cringing for a bone like Mr. Odgers of Saul with Grambler. Dr. Hulse and old Mr. Warleggan de Melza knew had been among the magistrates who had sentenced Jim. She was afraid for what might happen. A knock came at the door and she checked an impulse to start up as a maid entered. This has come, ma'am. I was told to bring it up to you. Thank you, ma'am. A dressing maid will be along in just a few minutes. Demelza stared at the packet. On the outside was written, Ross Poldark, Esquire. And over that, Ross had just scrawled in ink not yet dry for delivery to Mrs. Demelza Poldark. She pulled at the wrapping, took out a small box, parted some cotton packing, gasped. After a moment, gingerly, as if afraid of burning herself, she put in a finger and thumb and drew out the brooch. Oh, she said. She lifted it and held it to her breast so that she could see the effect in the mirror. The ruby glowed and winked at her. This gesture of Ross's was tremendous. It melted her. Her eyes, black and liquid with emotion, glowed back at herself above the ruby. This gift, 
if anything, would give her confidence. With a new dress and this, no one surely could look down on her. Even the maids could hardly do so. Another knock at the door and another maid entered. Demelza blinked and hastily crumpled up the packing in which the brooch had come. She was glad to see that they had sent an elderly maid. Well, she was in it. It wasn't decent, she was sure of that, but the maid didn't seem to think anything was amiss. Of course, other women wore this sort of thing. It was all the fashion, but other women might be used to this sort of gown. She was not. It was the same general shape as the afternoon gown Verity had bought her, only more so. The afternoon dress was cut away from the neck and the tops of her shoulders, but this one was so much lower. It was amazingly runched at the sides and there was a lot of beautiful lace hanging over her hands where she didn't need it. How Ross had bought it she could not conceive. It had cost a pretty penny, that was clear. He spent money on her as if it was chaff. Dear, dear Ross, unbelievably dear. If only poor Jim's death had not come between these presents and their wearing, how happy tonight would be. The maid had just finished her hair, piling it up and up. Since Julia's birth, she had not kept it clipped, but had let it grow and the sudden luxuriance of her surroundings, as Ross's wife, had seemed to give great richness to it, so that its darkness fairly gleamed with colour. The maid had brought her powder, the, her powder box, but she instantly concurred in de Melza's refusal. Such hair was not to be whitened. She did not, however, agree with de Melza's hesitant refusal of makeup and she was now attending to my lady's face. Demelza's restiveness under her hands had the result of keeping her dress's enthusiasm within bounds, and she came out of it with her dark eyebrows slightly lengthened, only a moderate amount of powder to harden the soft glow of her skin, and an excusable amount of rouge on her lips. One patch or two, ma'am, said the maid, Oh, none, thank ye. I have no liking for em, but ma'am would not be finished without one. May I suggest one just below the left eye? Oh, well, said Demelza, if you think so. Five minutes later, the jewel on her breast, she said, Can you tell me which is Miss Verity Poldark's room? The second down the passage, ma'am, on the right-hand side. <laughs>